Okay, so let's talk about intermolecular forces. Now, intermolecular forces, inter means between. And basically, these are forces that are between molecules, specifically covalent compounds, right? So let's take a look at covalent compounds. Now, before we actually take a look at these intermolecular forces, I want to take a look at covalent bonds. And there's two types of covalent bonds. We know that covalent bonds are due to electron sharing, right? So there's two types of covalent bonds. We can have a nonpolar covalent bond, which means that there is symmetrical electron sharing. Okay, what symmetrical electron sharing means is equal electron sharing, that the electrons are shared equally in equal distances from each atoms, right? Uh, there's also a polar covalent bond. Okay, so a polar covalent bond is where we would get asymmetric or asymmetrical unequal electron sharing. And this is where one nuclei or one uh, species will attract the electron closer to it versus the other, right? And you can understand that this is mainly due to electronegativity, right? Large electronegativity differences will cause unfair, um, unfair electron sharing. So electronegativity, once again, is electronegativity is basically the measure of how strong a nuclei or how strong an atom will attract a pair of external electrons, right? Um, how strong a nuclei attracts, or well, how strong a nucleus, nucleus singular, singular, right? A nucleus attracts uh, a pair or set of external electrons. Okay, so we can understand that changes in electronegativity, also known as electronegativity difference, and electronegativity difference is between the electronegativity of species um, 2 minus electronegativity of species 1. And this is going to be an absolute value, right? Different electronegativity differences will cause different covalent bonds. Now, in the case of a nonpolar covalent bond, the electronegativity difference here uh, would be greater um, or equal to zero, but less than 0 0.5. Okay, so you might see different values. These are the values I'm going to be giving you. Um, for an asymmetric electron sharing, uh, the electronegativity difference has to be greater or equal to 0 0.5 and less than 1.7. Okay, so a polar covalent bond is going to have this electronegativity difference. A nonpolar covalent bond is going to have this range of electronegativity differences. Now, the electronegativity difference scale, which is called a Pauling scale, right? These values are from the Pauling scale values. Um, the electronegativity differences can be between 0 and 4.2. Okay? So if the electronegativity difference is greater or equal to 1.7 and less than or equal to 4.2, this is a really strong. Um, electronegativity difference, and it's not going to constitute electron sharing anymore, right? We're going to have electron transfer. So this is common with ionic bonds, okay? So we're not going to be looking at ionic bonds for this discussion. We're only going to be looking at covalent bonds. So for the most part, we're going to be using this range and this range, right? Here's an example. Like, say we're looking at a molecule. Um, let's say we're looking at this molecule. Okay, so this is CH2O, this is called formaldehyde. Okay, um, and in this case, uh, if you're looking at for, uh, formaldehyde, which is also known as methanol. Okay, and that's not important right now, but we will discuss this more when we do organic chemistry. If we are looking at this molecule, um, let's take a look at some of the bond bonds that we can see. And these are all covalent bonds. So there's one bond here, and there's one bond here, okay? Um, you also have another carbon to hydrogen bond, but it's the same thing. So I'm going to assess these two bonds, right? Let's take a look at carbon to oxygen bond, and you want to treat the double bonds and single bonds the same way, okay? So let's take a look at the electronegativity difference between these two. So the electronegativity difference between the carbon and the oxygen is basically equal to the electronegativity of oxygen minus the electronegativity of carbon, and you, you need some kind of electronegativity table to do this. 
Okay, so you have to use the polling scale, um, and I'm gonna I have it here an electronegativity table, right? So I'm just gonna uh, pull it up here, and we can see that the electronegativity of oxygen. I don't know if you can see this too well, but the electronegativity of oxygen is 3.44, right? Um, so in this case, the electronegativity of oxygen is 3.44. The electronegativity of carbon looks like. Let's see if I can. Alright guys, I'm just gonna maybe expand this a little bit so we can see it better. Uh, it's 2.55, right? So let me just move that out of the way. Okay, so it's 2.55. Okay, so you can see this a lot easier when you're given a table. Usually we'll be given a table, you wouldn't need to memorize this, so don't worry about it. And for the last, for the next question, I'm just going to figure out the electronegativity of hydrogen, which also is it's 2.20. Okay, so let's get this out of the way, so we can. Oops. Oops. Sorry, guys. Wow. Okay, so let's just kind of get this out of the way here. Okay, so these are electronegativity values. Now, if I calculate this, the electronegativity of uh, the electronegativity difference between this carbon and oxygen bond is 3.44 minus 2.55, which is 0 0.89. Okay. Now we can understand that this electronegativity difference is greater than zero. It's, sorry, it's greater than 0 0.5, but less than 1.7. So therefore, this tells us that this is a polar covalent bond. And this also tells us that this is, has asymmetrical electron distribution. Okay, that means the electrons are being uh, distributed unevenly. Right? Now, what does that mean? Well, in this case, um, if we take a look at this structure in this molecule, right, that means that the electrons are actually closer to the oxygen. Now, if the electrons are closer to the oxygen, what's going to happen is the electrons are going to cause a negative charge. So there's going to be a slight negative charge at oxygen. Okay? And this symbol that I'm using, this is delta. This is used to show partial charges. Okay, so there's a slightly negative charge near the oxygen because of the fact that the electrons are actually slightly closer to the oxygen, right? So it's kind of like if you had eight Smarties and you were trying to uh, share it with your friend, right? Um, but you you're you're greedy, so you take five Smarties and you give them three, right? So it's basically um, asymmetrical sharing or distribution, right? Um, now, because the electrons are close to the oxygen, the carbon actually will have a slightly positive charge. One way we can show this is we show something using a dipole moment, right? So a dipole moment, which I'm going to mention out here, I'm just going to erase this out, but a dipole moment, we usually use dipole moments as mu. Right? A dipole moment is created when there is asymmetric electron distribution. And this occurs basically when um, the electrons are closer to one species and further away from another species, it creates, creates a dipole. A dipole is two regions with opposite charges, right? And the way we can show a dipole moment is we use a vector arrow. So this is what a dipole moment will look like. So this is a dipole moment, we'll call this mu. And basically the tip of the arrow here, the tip of the arrow, and it's basically a vector arrow, right? The tip of the arrow here shows um, the highly electronegative species, right? And the tail of the arrow here shows the low electronegative species. Okay, so using this notion, I'm going to show you where the dipole moment heads, but the dipole moment here should go this way. Okay, so it points towards the partially negative region, and it points away from the partially positive region. Good? So there is a dipole moment that's created. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of do this on the next page. Okay, so just to reiterate, we know that there is a dipole moment being created because there is an electronegativity difference between the carbon and hydrogen of 0 0.89, right? So there is a dipole moment being created, 
and this is leaving carbon partially positive, oxygen partially negative. We're using delta to represent partial charges. And the dipole moment just shows that um, the more electronegative species is going to have a higher affinity for oxygen, hence it's partially negative. Right, so this is partially negative, this is partially positive. Now, what we also need to look at is the next bond. We need to look at this carbon-hydrogen bond. Okay, so let's test the carbon-hydrogen bond. These are some of our electronegativity values that we got. And if we're looking at our carbon-hydrogen bond, I'm going to do the electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen. So this is equal to the electronegativity of carbon minus the electronegativity of hydrogen, which is basically 2.55 minus 2.20, which is 0 0.35. Okay? This tells us that the electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is greater or equal to zero, sorry, not 0 0.5, is greater or equal to zero but less than 0 0.5. So this tells us that this is symmetrical electron distribution. This is a non-polar covalent bond. Okay, so go back to the values that I gave you. And in this case, because it's nonpolar covalent, we have symmetrical electron distribution. So when you have symmetrical electron distribution, there is no dipole moment, no dipole moment created. So there is no dipole moment created, so as a result we don't draw one of those arrows, right? So once again a dipole moment is this arrow, right? So we don't get that in a symmetrical electron distribution, so we just don't include it, right? So technically this molecule, it does have a dipole, because this is the only arrow that's being created, right? So you can see that over time, this portion would be negative, this portion would be positive, and this creates a dipole, right? So it creates a dipole molecule, right? And a dipole molecule is known as a polar molecule. So a polar molecule is a molecule that contains a dipole and a dipole is basically is um, a region or two different regions of molecules. A dipole is created when two opposing regions of a molecule have opposite charges. So this is like our intro into um, nonpolar polar molecules. So let's do the different types of intramolecular forces. I'm going to abbreviate this as IMF. So the main types of intramolecular forces that we would see between molecules includes London dispersion forces, London dispersion forces, I'm going to call them LDF, dipole-dipole forces. A really strong set, I'm going to call this guy DDF. A really strong set of dipole dipole forces is called hydrogen bonding. So you use HB for this. These are just some of the abbreviations we're going to be using. And we're also going to be looking at ion dipole forces. Okay, specifically, we're going to see, we're going to have to also discuss ions. But for the most part, Line dispersion forces are found for nonpolar and polar molecules, basically all molecules, right? So let's just make, say, all molecules. So this could be, this includes uh, polar, nonpolar, ionic, etc. All molecules will have line dispersion force. I'll explain what a line dispersion force is. But for these guys, this set, these are only for polar molecules polar covalent molecules, right? Ion dipole forces will include ions, right? But you would specifically, for looking at molecules, is only going to be for polar covalent molecules, okay? But line dispersion forces will be will exist for all of them. Now let's start explaining what is this London dispersion force. London dispersion forces, right? Remember that an intramolecular force is a force between different molecules, right? It's a force that will hold different molecules together, okay? A London dispersion force is basically, it's a really weak form 
it's a really weak intramolecular force. I'm going to just make a note here. So it's a weak intramolecular force, right? And this is because of due to a temporary dipole being created. Okay, and I'll explain how these line dispersion forces exist. Let's say that this is your molecule. Okay, let's say this is some random molecule, right, in three dimensions. Okay, I mean this blob because we can understand that molecules won't have these ball and stick models that we're so used to. And in the molecule, we're going to have electrons, and those electrons are basically moving. Right, the electrons are moving in the structure, and they're constantly moving. Okay, in the molecule. Okay, but at one region in time what's going to happen is we might have a lot of electrons in one region of the molecule okay so normally this molecule is neutral so this, let's say this is a neutral molecule well let's say one region of, in one instant in time there's a lot of electrons in one region of the molecule okay so this portion here gets a partially negative charge okay because this portion here gets a partially negative charge because there's a lot of electrons here, there's less electrons in the other end. So this portion here gets a partially positive charge. But these chain, these electrons are constantly moving. So these charges fluctuate, right? At one instant in time, you might have high um, number of electrons in this portion, making it partially negative, but it, it's going to move out. So now in another region of time, um, you might have a partially negative charge here, right? And the charges will constantly keep fluxing. However, the charges, this notion will st stick together if you have two molecules that are adjacent to each other. So this is, let's say this is another neutral molecule. Okay. And when these electrons are constantly moving in this structure, and neutral just means that, it doesn't mean no charge, it means same number of positive and negative charges. When you have an abundance of electrons in this region of the molecule, this is going to cause the electrons in this molecule to move away right like charges repel because you have negative charge okay so let's now look at dipole dipole forces so a dipole once again is a hallmark feature of polar molecules and dipole dipole forces are specifically intermolecular forces and we call this ddf but these are intermolecular forces imf for intermolecular force intermolecular forces between two polar molecules so I think we lastly took a look at water molecules, okay? So if we take a look at a bottle of water and so forth, there's not going to be a single water molecule. There's going to be trillions and trillions of water molecules. It looks like one substance because these molecules are actually sticking to each other. Now, when we looked at the structure of water, for instance, and we showed that there was this electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen causing asymmetrical electron distribution. This was partially negative, partially positive, and partially positive. Now, what happens if we have an adjacent water molecule next to it? Okay, let's say we have an adjacent water molecule here. Whoops, sorry guys. Say we have an adjacent water molecule here, and this is also... Partial positive, partial positive, partial negative. What's going to happen is the partially positive regions are going to be attracted by the partially negative regions. You guys see that, right? And so this is partially negative, and then this part, this region here, will stick to that. Okay. And over time, um, these molecules will stick to each other collectively. And you can keep doing this for multiple water molecules. So say you have another water molecule here. And that's why substances appear to be solid, right? Or they appear to have one unifying structure. Right? They form solids and liquids and gases. They form different phases because these molecules actually stick to each other. Right? They form, in this case, it's fluid. You can see that we get these dipole-dipole forces that are occurring between partially positive regions and partially negative regions. So if I was going to define this, 
a dipole dipole force occurs when a partially positive region of a polar molecule is attracted by a partially negative region of an adjacent molecule. And vice versa. So you need opposite charges. It's basically electrostatic attraction. Now this electrostatic attraction is stronger than a dipole a line dispersion force. Electrostatic attraction force is stronger than a London dispersion force. A London dispersion force was created through a temporary dipole. This is actually created between an actual dipole. Okay, so that's why the the dipole-dipole forces are str much stronger than the London dispersion forces. But each of these water molecules, I'm going to um, show you that these are separate molecules. So this is one molecule. This is another molecule. Right. This is another molecule. Each of these water molecules also have London dispersion forces. So they have London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces. That's why water is, it, it binds to each other so well. Now we said that these dispersion forces or these intermolecular forces occur with adjacent molecules. If the molecules that in question that are adjacent to each other are the exact same molecule, this is an example of cohesion. Right? Cohesion is intermolecular forces between similar molecules. If they're the same molecule, if they're the same molecule, we have an idea, we have this notion of cohesion, right? It's the same molecule that's basically bonding to each other or having forces of attraction to each other, right? And the force that we're looking at, the cohesive forces, the cohesive forces in this case include London dispersion forces, right? All molecules have London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces. So keep that in mind. But you can also have the other case, which is called adhesion, Adhesion is when you have intramolecular forces between two or more different molecules. Right, so here is another molecule that we looked at earlier. This was ammonia. Okay, and I draw out water again. Let's draw it out here. So we have ammonia here, we have water here, and we just showed water's structure. This is a partial negative, partial positive, partial positive. For nitrogen, the dipole moments go towards the nitrogen. This is partial negative, partial positive, partial positive, partial positive. Okay. And what's going to happen here is nitrogen actually attracts this hydrogen. This oxygen attracts this hydrogen, right? And so forth. The nitrogen can attract the other hydrogen, but you can see that they stick together regardless, right? So this is a dipole dipole force, and here's another dipole dipole force, right? But once again, these both also have line dispersion forces, right? Even between different molecules, you'd have line dispersion force. This is one molecule, this is the other molecule, okay? And this is an example of adhesion. So this is what we call an adhesive force. Adhesion occurs between attractions of two different molecules and the adhesive forces here include dipole-dipole forces and London dispersion force. I would always do this in order. I would always write London dispersion force first and then dipole-dipole. And London dispersion force works with every molecule. Okay. Yeah, so let's now look at dipole-dipole forces. So a dipole once again is a hallmark feature of polar molecules. And dipole-dipole forces are specifically intermolecular forces, and we call this DDF, but these are intermolecular forces, IMF for intermolecular force, intermolecular forces between two polar molecules. Okay, so I think we lastly took a look at water molecules, okay? 
So if we take a look at a bottle of water and so forth, there's not going to be a single water molecule. There's going to be trillions and trillions of water molecules. It looks like one substance because these molecules are actually sticking to each other. Now, when we looked at the structure of water, for instance, and we showed that there was this electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen causing asymmetrical electron distribution. This was partially negative, partially positive, and partially positive. Now, what happens if we have an adjacent water molecule next to it? Okay, let's say we have an adjacent water molecule here. Whoops, sorry guys. Let's say we have an adjacent water molecule here, and this is also partial positive, partial positive, partial negative. What's going to happen is the partially positive regions are going to be attracted by the partially negative regions. You guys see that? Right? And so this is partially negative, and then this part, this region here will stick to that. Okay? And over time, um, these molecules will stick to each other collectively. And you can keep doing this for multiple water molecules. So say you have another water molecule here. And that's why substances appear to be solid, right? Or they appear to have one unifying structure. Right? They form solids and liquids and gases. They form different phases because these molecules actually stick to each other. Right? They form, in this case, it's fluid. You can see that we get these dipole-dipole forces that are occurring between partially positive regions and partially negative regions. So if I was going to define this, a dipole-dipole force occurs when a partially positive region of a polar molecule is attracted by a partially negative region of an adjacent molecule. And vice versa. So you need opposite charges. It's basically electrostatic attraction. Now this electrostatic attraction is stronger than a dipole a line dispersion force. Electrostatic attraction force is stronger than a London dispersion force. A London dispersion force was created through a temporary dipole. This is actually created between an actual dipole. Okay, so that's why the, the, the dipole-dipole forces are str much stronger than the London dispersion forces. But each of these water molecules, I'm going to um, show you that these are separate molecules. So this is one molecule, this is another molecule, Right, this is another molecule. Each of these water molecules also have London dispersion forces. So they have London dispersion forces and dipole dipole forces. That's why water is it, it binds to each other so well. Now we said that these dispersion forces or these intermolecular forces occur with adjacent molecules. If the molecules that in question that are adjacent to each other are the exact same molecule, this is an example of cohesion. Right? Cohesion is intramolecular forces between similar molecules. If they're the same molecule, if they're the same molecule, we have an idea we have this notion of cohesion. Right? It's the same molecule that's basically bonding to each other or having forces of attraction to each other. Right? And the force that we're looking at, the cohesive forces, the cohesive forces in this case include London dispersion forces, right? All molecules have London dispersion forces and dipole dipole forces. So keep that in mind. But you can also have the other case, which is called adhesion. Adhesion is when you have intramolecular forces between two or more different molecules. Right? So here is another molecule that we looked at earlier. This was ammonia. Okay, and I'm going to draw out water again. Let's draw it out here. Okay, so we have ammonia here, we have water here, 
and we just showed water's structure. This is a partial negative, partial positive, partial positive. For nitrogen, the dipole moments go towards the nitrogen. This is partial negative, partial positive, partial positive, partial positive. Okay. And what's going to happen here is nitrogen actually attracts this hydrogen. This oxygen attracts this hydrogen, right? And so forth. The nitrogen can attract the other hydrogen, but you can see that they stick together regardless, right? So this is a dipole dipole force. And here's another dipole dipole force, right? But once again, these both also have line dispersion forces, right? Even between different molecules, you'd have line dispersion force. This is one molecule, this is the other molecule. Okay, and this is an example of adhesion. So this is what we call an adhesive force. Adhesion occurs between attractions of two different molecules, and the adhesive forces here include dipole-dipole forces and London dispersion force. I would always do this in order. I would always write London dispersion force first, and then dipole-dipole. And London dispersion force works with every molecule. Okay. Okay, so continuing our discussion on intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding is just a really strong form of dipole-dipole forces between highly electronegative species. This, what I mean by this is when the electronegativity difference is very large, and this usually happens between nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These are our three most electronegative atoms, three most electronegative atoms, called these the heteroatoms. The heteroatoms are basically the three most electronegative atoms. And when you take the three most electronegative atoms and you compare the electronegativity to hydrogen, which has the lowest electronegativity, right, because it's 2.20, it has one of the lowest electronegativities for nonmetals, then the electronegativity difference is very large, right? So in this case, um, if you have a bond between nitrogen and hydrogen, oxygen and hydrogen, and fluorine and hydrogen, this forms a really strong dipole moment, right? So it forms a really strong dipole moment, which makes a really strong negative charge, okay? Now this really strong negative charge will attract hydrogen which has a really positive charge very strongly. So for instance, if you have two ammonia atoms, sorry, two ammonia molecules, the two ammonia molecules, and we show the structure of ammonia recently, and let's say we we're looking at an example of a cohesive force. So that means that we have the same two molecules that are attracting each other. Okay, so we have the same two molecules attracting each other, and what's going to happen here is there's a strong negative charge here, there's a really strong positive charge here, strong positive here, strong negative here, and as a result, there's a really strong dipole-dipole force here. Okay, and this really strong dipole-dipole force is called hydrogen bonding. So technically it is a dipole-dipole force, so you can write dipole-dipole, but you have to mention that it's a really strong dipole-dipole. So hydrogen bonding is its, its third structure, right? and you can also see that here. There's a really strong dipole-dipole here, hydrogen bonding, right? So this is an example of cohesive forces because the molecules are the same molecule, but you can also see dipole-dipole hydrogen bonding in adhesive forces. So let's l take a look at the previous example, and we showed nitrogen, sorry, ammonia and water okay so we showed ammonia and water and the electronegativity goes here so this is partial negative, this is partial positive, but you can understand that this is a really strong partial negative because it's one of the heteroatoms, it's oxygen and, and hydrogen. So this is a really strong partial negative, it's a really strong partial positive, and as a result, there is a strong force of attraction. Right, and this is this really strong dipole-dipole force, 
a strong dipole-dipole force, which we're going to call hydrogen bonding. Right? And you would see the same thing here as well. Between the nitrogen and hydrogen, there's a strong dipole-dipole force called hydrogen bonding because the hydrogen itself has a very strong positive charge. Good? And yep. you can see the same thing out here as well. Okay, so that's why these guys stick to each other so well, and that's why they dissolve with each other so well. That's why you can dissolve um, aqueous ammonia and water really well, right? Um, and this is also true with alcohols, for instance, and we'll look at the structures later. So this notion of solubility is dependent on intramolecular forces. Other characteristics that are dependent on intramolecular forces also include um, melting point, boiling point, right, so phases, like solid, liquid, and gas, but also phase changes, like melting point, melting, boiling, uh, vaporization, and so forth, right? Conductivity is another thing that's associated with intramolecular forces. Heat capacity is another thing that's associated with intermolecular forces. Anything that's associated with intermolecular forces is called a physical change. Anything that changes due to intramolecular forces, right? Well, sorry. Anything that is associated with intramolecular forces is called a physical property. So these are all examples of physical properties. Anything that changes according to intramolecular forces constitutes a physical change. So we'll take a look at these physical properties and physical changes, but the ones that I'm going to really focus on are phases, phase changes, and solubility for the most part. Right? There are also other um, physical properties as well, right? but right now we're just going to look at some of these three. These are the three most important. Um, and the difference between a physical change and a chemical change is that a chemical change will look at changes in intramolecular forces. Intramolecular means within, inter means between, right? Um, forces between the molecule, this includes covalent bonds. Ionic bonds, metallic bonds. We're using um, mole molecule um, as a broad term here, metallic bonds. Okay, these are what we were looking at previously. We're constituting chemical changes, right? Reactivity is associated with chemical changes, the creation, the breaking, and formation of bonds. Right? We looked at covalent bonds, ionic bonds, but now we're going to be looking at physical properties, right? We're looking at the intramolecular forces between different molecules and how it constitutes solubility, phases, phase changes, and so forth. Okay, so this is what we're going to be discussing, but you can notice that the more intramolecular forces a species has, in this case both species for the adhesion and cohesion, right, in the cohesion we had two of the same molecules, in the adhesion we have two different molecules, so we'll call this guy one of the molecules, and this guy is another molecule. So in the adhesion we have two different molecules, right? This is an adhesive force, these are cohesive forces, right? But in both cases we had Lund dispersion forces. In all cases we have Lund dispersion forces. We had dipole-dipole forces and a strong type of dipole-dipole, which was hydrogen bonding. So these are really strong forces of attraction, right? And we're going to relate these intramolecular forces to some of these physical properties. Okay, so I'm going to briefly also discuss ion dipole forces. This is like the strongest force, the strongest intramolecular force, and it's really close to the threshold of ionic bonds. An ion, an ion dipole force occurs between an ion, or charged atom, and a polar molecule. Okay, an example of this occurs, let's say we... Uh, take sodium chloride, which is salt, usual table salt, and I react this with water, I undergo a hydrolysis reaction. This actually splits into its respective ions. This is sodium ion, uh, chloride ion, and this also has water there. 
And what's going to happen is uh, when you mix the salt with water and you stir it, you're going to actually see one thing. It basically just looks like water, right? It might get a little murky depending on how much salt you, you put in, how much salt you put in. But it tastes like salt water, right? So it has one phase. It looks like one thing, but in, it has a different characteristic, right? And I'm going to explain how that actually occurs. Now, if we take a look at the water molecule again, we can see that water is the most common solvent, guys. And the solvent is always the higher... Um, amount that's found in a solution okay and in this case this is a water molecule and we showed earlier that the dipole moments are going this way so this is partial negative partial positive partial positive and when you dissolve the sodium chloride in water it splits into its individual ions let's say that this is the sodium ion there's multiple water molecules that are surrounding it as shown Okay, so there's multiple water molecules that surround it, right? It kind of like, um, it's kind of like ganging up on it, basically. That's what it looks like, right? It's like outnumbered, right? So there's multiple water molecules surrounding it. These are all partial negative. And what's going to happen here is that the negative portions of the polar molecule, they actually stick and they attract the positive ion. It creates a shell around the ion. Right, so think about the water molecules in white here, right? It basically creates the shell around the ion shown here, and the sodium is now um, in the middle. Okay, that kind of looks like an egg, but um, so it, it basically looks like this. So we only see the outer region of the water molecules, right? So it looks, um, so that's why it still looks like water, but it tastes like salt, right? And in this case, this is a notion called hydration. Okay, this is specifically when water will attach itself or it will bond using intramolecular forces to um, to an ion, right? So this is an ion dipole force. I'm going to call this IDF, ion dipole force. So these are these ion dipole forces, but you can also imagine, so you can imagine this is one molecule, this is another molecule, and so forth, right? But you can also imagine here that... Um, these other mo these molecules also have dipole dipole forces, Lund dispersion forces. So I would list this in order. Let's go from weakest to strongest. Lund dispersion forces being the weakest, dipole dipole forces. It doesn't have hydrogen bonding because it's oxygen and uh, metal, but it's very strong to hydrogen bonding. And this is an ion dipole force. Okay, so this is very strong sense of bonding structure. And this is the strongest intramolecular force. This is very, this is very strong in a sense. Okay, it's really hard to reverse this. Okay, and you can see, imagine the same thing is actually happening with this chloride anion, right? The chloride anion, which we'll draw out here, choose a different color. So let's say that the chloride anion is here, right? And this is part. This is negative, and you can imagine that the water molecules, the positive side. will stick to the partially positive sides will stick to the anion. Okay, so Okay, so the partially positive sides will stick to the anion, so it does that. Right, and you can imagine here that this also hydrates, it encapsulates, it covers this ion. Okay, so this is like weird purple egg now. So it basically does that, right? So you can dissolve chloride just the same way, right? And you can also see another set of ion dipole forces present there. Okay, so ion dipole forces are between an ion and a polar molecule, and the whole notion here is that opposites attract, that's the idea. So now we're going to be looking at phases and phase changes. A phase is just a state of matter. Okay, so phase is a state of matter of a substance. Um, there's four states of matter, guys. So the four states of matter include solid, liquid, 
gases. But also there's this fourth state of matter called plasma. A plasma is basically where you take a gas and you heat it to a high extent that the electrons actually get delocalized. So it's a gas that is ionized, basically. It's an ionized gas. Right, so it's very cool because it, you know, it has certain colors and textures and so forth. We're not going to look at this. We're only looking at these three. This is an introductory chemistry video, chem chemistry course. Right. Um, so anyways, to understand these three states of matter and how we can look at phase changes, I'm going to look at water because water actually exists in all three states. Okay. So let's take a look at water and I'm going to look at its three states of matter. We want to kind of compare this to our description of intramolecular forces. Okay, so I'm just going to draw this out. I'll show you guys what each of this looks like, and we're going to label this basically. Okay, and um, because I don't want to draw water molecules out, I'm going to let this little circle thing represent H2O. So technically, each of these circles represents one of these molecules. And once again, we looked at the Vespar architecture and we looked at the dipole moments. This is partial negative partial positive, partial positive. So imagine that for each of them, all right? So you want to look at dipole-dipole forces. Okay, so one of the states of matter of water is solid water. And solid water, H2O, solid, this is also known as ice, right? It usually occurs at less than zero degrees, right? And in this case, the molecules are actually somewhat close together. Okay, so the, the, you can see that there's really strong intramolecular forces. So in red, I'm going to draw the intramolecular forces, guys. So this means intramolecular force. And you can think about the types of intramolecular forces we looked at. Because it's water is a polar molecule, some of the possible intramolecular forces include London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, but also hydrogen bonding. These three are going to exist in all of these water molecules. So that's why um, water can create some of these structures. Okay, so these are the intramolecular forces that kind of creates ice, right? So that's why it solidifies, right? Um, so that's ice, and we can keep going with this, but I think you guys get the idea behind this. Okay, so this is ice. And what happens here is, now when the ice molecules gain energy, specifically thermal energy, when it gains energy, what's going to happen here is... If it gains energy, I'm going to say heat, triangle, right? If it gains heat, what's going to happen here? And triangle here means heat. If it gains heat, what's going to happen is these particles have more kinetic energy, so they can actually move further and further away. So when they move further and further away, at a certain point, the molecules will become more fluid. And there's a weaker force of attraction. And so you can see that here, there's a weaker force of attraction Okay, so there's a weaker force of attraction, and as a result, this is going to become liquid water. Okay, so this is liquid water. This is general water that we consider. So this is liquid water. Liquid water. This usually occurs greater than zero degrees Celsius. Good. In this process, at zero degrees Celsius, at zero degrees Celsius, we get a process where we have a phase change. A phase change is a change in the state of matter. And in this case, when you change from a solid state of matter to a liquid state of matter, you get this process called melting. Okay, and you have to add heat to melt. Okay, so you get melting when you add heat, right? Um, and this occurs in this temperature, the zero degrees Celsius is known as the melting point. Okay, so keep this in mind, right? Although you might have looked at this in previous grades, um, now we have a better understanding of intramolecular forces, so you guys can understand that. The idea here is that when you add heat, it actually breaks, it causes more kinetic energy uh, in the particles, and that kinetic energy means there's less intramolecular forces holding the particles. The particles have more energy now, the molecules have more energy now to break free from the intramolecular forces. Now some of the intramolecular forces break, and you have less intramolecular forces, so now you have a change from a solid to a liquid, and some of the characteristics of a liquid. The temperature at which this process melting occurs is called a melting point, it's at zero degrees Celsius, approximately. Now in the opposite scenario, 
if you lose heat, if you lose heat, so let's say we subtract heat, right? This process is known as freezing. In this case, what's happening is when you're losing heat, the particles have less and less kinetic energy. As a result, more intramolecular forces can start occurring between the species, and as a result, um, the liquid will change into the solid state. In the solid state, you can notice that there's more particles more densely packed. In the liquid state, there's less particles densely packed. Um, as a result, they're more sparsely located, and there's some of the, uh, some of the characteristics of a liquid versus a solid. Solids have de definite shapes. Um, liquid don't have definite shapes. They take the shape of their container, right? They're like fluid-like. Okay, this occurs at a specific temperature as well, usually less than zero degrees Celsius, right? And that's when you get the freezing point, okay? So this is called the freezing point. Okay, so collectively we can say that freezing point, freezing usually occurs at zero degrees. Melting, we can say it's a, but a bit higher than zero degrees. Okay, so let's just make a correction here, actually. Let's say that this is at zero degrees. Makes more sense. So at zero degrees, you're gonna start the freezing point. You've hit the freezing point. Below that, you're gonna start freezing. Okay, now collectively, this is gonna be called, so these two collectively are called fusion. Melting and freezing is called fusion. Melting and freezing are called fusion. Right? But one of them requires heat, and the other one doesn't require heat. We're going to talk about this more in our thermodynamic unit. Okay? Now let's say we're going from liquid water right, to gaseous water. And this is what gaseous water looks like. Gaseous water, the particles are really far apart. Right? There's a really weak force of attraction. Okay? There's a really weak force of attraction. Okay, this is gaseous water, also known, see this is in white. Gaseous water is also known as water vapor. Okay, and this usually occurs, um, you have to add heat to this because you need to break a lot of the intramolecular forces holding this. So you need to break some of these line dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding uh, forces. And you have to add heat to this. And this process from changing a liquid to a gas is called boiling. Okay. The opposite process, if you take away heat, if you take away heat, this process is called condensation. Okay, so this process is called condensation. Okay. And the boiling point of water occurs at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is the boiling point of water. It's a boiling point is a temperature in which boiling occurs. And the condensation point of water is anything less than 100 degrees Celsius. Right, it reverts back to a liquid state. Okay, so this is the condensation point. Good. And collectively, these two processes, boiling and condensation, this represents something called vaporization. So vaporization, boiling is an addition of water, sorry, addition of heat, and condensation or condensing is an absence of heat or a loss of heat. Make sense? Okay, so those are the cases from liquid to solid or solid to liquid, liquid to gas, gas to liquid. But we can also consider um, a solid to a gas immediately, right? So a solid to a gas is called sublimation. Let's see if I can draw that here somewhere. If you're going from, oops, I'll use orange here. Let's say you're going from solid, and you need a, a ton of heat to do this, guys. So if you're going from a solid to a gas, this, you need tons of heat. This is called sublimation. Okay, and there's a certain sublimation point, right? Which is gonna be, if you superheat 
um, a solid ice to 100 degrees Celsius, you can vaporize it, right? So it's the same as the, the boiling point, but you're just doing it at very quick speed. Okay, so you need to put in a ton of energy, right? And the other process, I'm going from a gas, so if you're immediately freezing water, if you're going from a gas, oops, maybe I'll stop here. When you're going from a gas, so this is absence of heat, you're going, you're going from a gas to a solid, this is called deposition. Okay, you can understand how this will occur. Okay, for the most part, we want to look at uh, fusion and um, vaporization, right? But collectively, sublimation and deposition is just called sublimation. So these are these two are called sublimations, right? But if you have negative heat, then you have deposition. Okay. So that's the phases, those are different phases that will exist for different states of matter, for different, um, sorry, for different substances. We also looked at some of the phase changes that those substances can occur. I use water as an example because um, it exists in all three states, and as a result, we can kind of clearly summarize this whole thing collectively. So try to understand this, um, really understand the melting point, freezing point, boiling point, condensation point, um, sublimation, deposition, just know these terms, it's going to be really important for thermodynamics.